Thank you, Ove. Well, the basis of this title and part of my talk is a review paper that I'm working on with my collaborators, uh, Linda Blackhall, Bry Wilson, and Ruth Gates. And during early discussions for this uh, paper, we kept on saying to each other, oh, corals are the most diverse symbioses in the world. But then when we looked in the literature, it's actually not too easy to find any, any support for that statement. So we decided to look into that in a little, little bit more detail. And the, the different layers of diversity that we tried to peel off and that I will briefly talk about are the, the range of eukaryotes uh, associated with corals, the intraspecific genetic diversity, diversity in algal and symbionts, as well as bacterial and viral diversity and abundance. Now corals, because they deposit the skeleton and, and in that way contribute to the three-dimensionality of coral reefs, provide habitat to a, a, a suite of eukaryotes. And those range from, from fish to uh, crabs and other crustaceans, sponges, polychaetes, dinoflagellates, um, symbiodinium, the zooxanthellae, uh, filamentous green algae that can be endolytic, fungi, protozoan, uh, other, other nadarians, bivalves, and, uh, and echinoderms. And while you may argue that some of those eukaryotes are only loosely associated with the coral state, that some have been demonstrated to be true mutualists. For example, this little crab here, um, uh, reduces the spread of coral disease in, in, in diseased corals because it eats away the diseased coral tissue. So it has a truly mutualistic um, relationship. And of course, each of these eukaryotes asso associates with its own diversity of prokaryotic and acellular symbionts, which we haven't even begun to characterize. So that already provides an enormous diversity in, in symbionts. Now, how does this compare to uh, model symbiosis? And the key Nadarian models are, of course, the green hydra and the sea anemone, the sea anemone aptasia. And they are much simpler um, um, organisms in terms of their morphology. And as far as I could find, um, they might associate with fungi and protozoans, but not, not with any, any other, uh, or not many other eukaryotic symbionts. Um, one of the... the um, best studied uh, marine symbiosis is the light organ in the Hawaiian bobtail squid, um, in which the light organ is colonized by a single bacterium, uh, Vibrio fischeri. And um, as far as we know, there's no eukaryotes associated with this um, light organ. Of course, um, one of the best studies, uh, studied symbiosis is um, the human microbiome, and in particular the uh, human gut microbiome. But there again, you know, um, eukaryotes um, are mostly parasite eukaryotes that associate with humans, mites, worms, protozoans, fungi. Um, but, but the diversity that we see in a coral is not existent. I'd like to note that there's one other group of marine invertebrates, the sponges, that are equally diverse in terms of their eukaryotic symbionts. Um, some sponges are photo photosynthetic and they can associate with symbiodinium, red or green algae, diatoms. And in addition, they associate with fungi, protozoans, crustaceans, mollusks, nadarians, worms, fish, and echinoderms. So they, they provide a similar diversity of eukaryotic symbionts compared to coral. Now the next layer of diversity that we looked at is um, the nuclear DNA diversity. And here in this graph, I express that as um, the number of nucleotides on the genome in which we find a variable site, a single nucleotide polymorphism. So that means that the lower the value in the graph is, the higher the genetic diversity in that organism is. And we can see immediately that humans here in red um, show relatively low levels of diversity. But corals show quite high levels of diversity. And I was at a, at a workshop yesterday where some um, unpublished genome data were discussed. And probably when we sequence more coral genomes, we find that the diversity is even higher than we think, than, than we think it is today. Sponges, again, also very high diversity. Hydra and Aptasia, a little bit lower uh, compared to corals. So again, corals are very diverse at this level. Now this table summarizes the other layers of diversity that I would like to talk about briefly. And one thing we should realize though that, that these different organisms, you know, we're talking about very different taxonomic levels. When we, when we talk about the coral symbiosis, we usually refer to sclerotinian corals and there's about 1400 species. The green hydra, there's only one, there's two tropical Aptasia species, three um, squid species that have this, this light organ symbiosis, one human species, and the sponges, of course, it's a whole phylum. There are thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of species. 
In terms of algal and the symbionts, again, the corals are very diverse. There are hundreds of species of symbiodinium in corals, and very small numbers in the model cnidarian symbioses. Sponges are not so well characterized in that respect. Um, most symbiotic, um, photosymbiotic sponges associate with cyanobacteria, so they shouldn't really, you know, they don't fall under the, the eukaryotic symbionts. And in terms of symbiodinium, again, we, we don't really know, but probably sim similar diversity to corals. Um, number of algal uh, and the symbiont species per individual, again, very high in corals and, and, um, and lower in, in, in other organisms. Now, the, the next two levels of diversity I want to discuss, um, it, you know, th there's a lot of variation in the different studies that have been published, and they're also the, the um, estimates that the, that, is, that the studies report are very, depend on the methods used. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you look at the number of bacterial cells um, associated with an individual, it's, it's, it's very hard to decide which unit you're going to use. For example, in the literature, people tend to use the um, number of bacteria per square centimeter. But if you look at humans, there's a huge difference whether you use the external surface area, which is about one and a half to two square meters, or whether you include the intestinal surface area, which is about 100 square meter. But if we look at the number of bacteria per individual, very high in corals, lower in hydra, but it's a very small organisms, organism, and about 10 to the 14th in humans. So humans have at about 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in their body. And we have about a kilogram of bacteria in our gut, so very important symbionts. Sponges, again, there's very little known, and, and you know, the, the, the body size of sponges is so variable, but very high number of bacteria, of course, as they are filter feeders. Now, in terms of the number of um, operational taxonomic units of bacteria, I think it's, it's much more similar across um, um, different taxa, about between tens and thousands of OTUs. In coral, it de depends a lot at where you look, whether, and we saw that in Bill's talk too, whether you look in the tissue or in the mucus, um, we find l a very large differences. And the last group, the viruses, are very poorly characterized in, in most organisms. And, and these figures are, are um, they're probably, they will probably change in the years to come, but, but what we do know is that um, there's lots of viral particles associated with corals, and there's also enormous viral diversity um, associated with corals. Um, so in, in summary, um, yes, corals are um, very high um, symbiotic models, but so are the sponges. But um, those are probably the most diverse we know to date. And this diversity is important in terms of how the coral can cope with environmental change. And this was first posed by Kitano, and he calls it biological robustness and um, the extended phenotype. And uh, robustness is defined as a property that allows a system to maintain its functions against ex internal and external perturba perturbations. Um, this hypothesis was later rephrased in a way by uh, Eugene Rosenberg, and this, he calls it the hologene th hologenome theory, but it's basically a very similar um, hypothesis. So basically what it claims is that um, the genomes of the host and the sim symbionts interact, and that allows the organism to uh, live in a wider range of environment environments, deal better with environmental change, and possibly adapt faster because especially the um, the prokaryotic symbionts have uh, higher evolutionary rates compa compared to eukaryotes. Now, all eukaryotes have extended their phenotype by the acquisition of non-host systems. And this, um, this diagram, which comes from the Kitano and Oda paper, summarizes the different processes that eukaryotes have used. Um, first, um, eukaryotes have acquired genes from other species that's called horizontal or lateral gene transfer. Eukaryotes have acquired um, bacteria, they have engulfed them, and over evolutionary time, these have evolved into um, organelles, um, mitochondria and chloroplasts. And they have acquired um, uh, bacteria that are mat maternally transmitted, so very tight association, as well as bacteria that are um, horizontally transmitted, that have to be acquired from the environment at every generation. And, and again, uh, I want to stress that um, corals are indeed one of the most diverse symbiotic systems, so all these um, processes will be very important. Um, 
and that is not, it's not only um, the case for bacterial symbionts, but um, also for eukaryotic symbionts, and in particular symbiodinium. We now, now know quite well that um, the type of symbiodinium has a large impact on the physiological tolerances of corals, such as thermal tolerance, growth rate, and so on. But also the viruses, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the viruses in the second part of my talk, because this is an area that my group at Ames has re recently moved into. Now, when I say viruses, I'm, I, I, I talk sort of more generally about both the viruses associated with eukaryotes as well as the viruses associated with prokaryotes, which are more commonly known as bacteriophages or simply phage. Now, why are viruses important entities to study? Well, first of, first of all, viruses are often responsible for one of those processes of uh, the acquisition of non-host system, lateral or horizontal gene transfer, the acquisition of genes from another species. And, and this is a nice example here, I think, um, the sea slug. It feeds on a, on a green algae and then uses the chloroplast to photosynthesize. However, um, for photosynthesis to occur, some of the genes that are necessary are um, not encoded by the chloroplast genome, but, but by the nuclear genome of the, the alga. And for a long time, uh, we didn't understand how the slug was able to photosynthesize until um, it was uh, discovered that a nuclear encoded gene, uh, photosynthesis gene of the alga is present in, in the slug's genome. Now, because the slug associates with high numbers of uh, viral particles, it is assumed that viruses have mediated the transfer of this gene from, from the food, from the green alga, to the slug's genome. So it has allowed, it, it, it has allowed the slug to, to very efficiently uh, use energy from the sun and not solely rely on food it needs to eat. Viruses are also important because they control host populations, and this is best known from um, the end of uh, phytoplankton blooms. Many phytoplankton blooms are ended by viral lysis. And this slide here shows a, oops, shows a, a satellite image um, of the English Channel, and the, the white sort of areas are, are caused by the, the, the calcium carbonate platelets of this um, phytoplankton species, Emiliania huxleyi which has been lysed by, by viruses. Now, when this happen, happens, large amounts of nutrients are released into the, to the environment, so viruses contribute to nutrient cycling in this way. Um, the lysis of this alga also causes uh, the release of a large amount of DMS, and in this way, viruses contribute to cloud, cloud formation and, and the weather. Most people think of viruses as uh, things that are bad for you, that are pathogens, and many viruses are pathogens. But um, what many people don't know is that some viruses are true mutualists. And again, I'll give you an example here, and this example comes from this species of panic grass, which lives in Yellowstone National Park uh, geothermal soils. The grass lives in symbiosis with a fungus, and the fungus harbors a virus. Now, if you rid the fungus of the virus, the grass loses its thermal tolerance. And um, it has been shown that this virus causes a, a persistent infection, which means it has integrated its, its genome into that of the host, as indicated here by this red little squiggly thing. But it, but it doesn't actually cause a very active infection, so it doesn't make the, it's not, it's, it very, shows very low or expression levels or it's not expressed at all. But, and we don't understand the, the exact mechanism, but it has been demonstrated that this virus leads to the production of protective compounds in the fungus, as well as the activation of heat shock proteins. So, you know, the presence of a virus can be very beneficial to a host. Of course, as I mentioned before, viruses can be pathogens, but they can also sometimes assist in disease resistance or the control of disease. And this is a... Um, a topic of one of our PhD uh, students, Patrick uh, Berger. So viruses can cause disease by lysing probiotic bacteria, the bacteria that are good for you, or by lysing the eukaryotic cells, the host cells. But it can also prevent the disease by causing pathogenic bacteria. Um, as I just described, you know, persistent viral infections can sometimes uh, times protect an organism from infection by other viruses by this um, uh, we call it lysogenic conversion, just by changing gene expression levels in the host genome. 
And finally, um, it is possible in some instances to um, to use phage as a, as a to use phage therapy to control disease. Now, finally, viruses are the most abundant entities um, in the sea. So um, there are about a hundred million viruses in in a, um, a teaspoon of seawater. And the background of this slide is um, an epifluorescent uh, microscope image of a drop of seawater. And you can see that the tiniest spots are viruses, and they're enormously abundant. And viruses infect all cellular organisms, so they're going to play a role in all life that we study. Now, um, <clears throat> and I wish I could give this talk in two or three months because we're on the verge of acquiring um, some large data sets, but I'll, I'll, I'll briefly tell you what we are up to. So, to try and begin to understand uh, the range of functions that viruses play in corals, um, one of the approaches we use is to describe the diversity of these viral communities in space and time. And we do that by metagenome sequencing, so we isolate the uh, total population of viral genomes that is associated with the coral, and we sequence that using next generation sequencing uh, methods. And at the moment, we are, um, we are, we are uh, about to sequence um, the variants of, of a few coral species, and hopefully um, of up to, up to 10 coral species, to examine whether there's any species specificity. We will also look at variants in one species of corals throughout an experimental heat stress um, experiments in healthy and diseased tissue and um, uh, from corals collected um, near CO2 seeps versus control area, just to begin to understand how variation of viral communities varies in space and time. And this is just a plot of one, of one recent um, um, virome that we have acquired from Postlepora damacornis. Don't look at the details, but you can already, this, this is a plot um, at the family level. There's a lot more diversity hidden behind each of these family, but it shows you um, how much diversity there can be. And this is only the DNA virome. Viruses can have either DNA or RNA genomes, and so, so we look at both the DNA and the, and the RNA viromes. Another project that we're looking at is um, whether symbiodinium um, has a latent viral infection that may be involved in some instances of coral bleaching. And there are some older studies where people have demonstrated some viral particles associated with symbiodinium. Um, again, so a latent infection is, is one type of persistent infection. So a virus infects um, the cell, and then rather than, than causing a, an active infection that lyses the cell, it integrates its DNA into that of the host, or it persists, the, the genome persists on an episome in the host cell. It's, it's like um, um, us, it's so, and so what happens, a stress event, and mostly UV or heat, can um, induce this virus to go, into the lit, uh, to, in, to go into the lytic cycle, which is an active in infection. Um, with humans, an example is a cold sore. It's a virus that, is a, that causes a persistent infection in some of your nerve cells. And when you're very run down or you, you, you have too much sun exposure, too much UV, you can develop a cold sore, which means that that virus has begun to replicate in the cell and it causes the symptoms um, of, of the viral infection. So it's the same in symbiodinium. You know, it has been demonstrated that stress um, can, can induce um, the presence of a virus, and, and so it's likely that there is some sort of latent infection in symbiodinium. So what we did is we exposed um, cultured symbiodinium um, to UV stress, and here I show um, flow cytometer plots of um, a control sample and two UV shocked samples. And, um, well, um, it's impossible to get um, azenic semidinium cultures. They seem, there seem to be bacteria that they need um, for growth and survival. So there's some bacteria, but we also find a clear viral population associated with both with the control and the, sh the UV shocked um, cultures. <clears throat> we then looked at these semidinium cells using transmission electron mic microscopy. And um, here in the left-hand corner, it, this is a, a healthy cell with um, the nucleus with condensed chromosomes, chloroplasts, lipid droplets. Um, looks pretty normal. But we also had cells um, at various stages of disintegration. Here we can see the nucleus which is starting to disintegrate, and we see uh, viral-like particles um, occurring here. This is the later stage of disintegration, and the cell is completely full of these uh, viral-like uh, viral particles. 
In uh, figure D, we see a close-up of these viral-like um, particles. Now, the fact that we observed these... Um, am I out of time? <laughs> okay, I'll be, I'm almost done. And the fact that we observed these particles in, in uh, control and heat sho uh, UV shocked um, samples means that it, there's likely some sort of persistent infection in uh, simoidinium. And it's quite interesting um, that it has been demonstrated that uh, dinoflagellates, they, ha they have hi histones to, con to bind to their DNA and condense their chromosomes, but they don't, they don't actually use them as such. They use a different protein called dinoflagellate virus nucleoproteins. And these protein proteins have only been found in, in dinoflagellates and a family of large algal viruses, the Fakotna vir viridae. And the DVMPs are also uh, present in the simoidinium minutum genome. So we have isolated um, those uh, viral particles from our uh, flow cytometry and uh, um, isolated their um, genomes and are in the process of sequencing them. And then we can search the, the simoidinium genome for the presence of um, these viruses. So a summary and conclusions, um, scleractinian corals present one of the most diverse symbioses, and this provides an enormous scope for them to cope with environmental um, change. And areas we should uh, look at in the future, I think, functional redundancies between um, taxonomically unrelated organism, novel traits that these symbionts provide, and adaptabil adapt adaptability. So characterizing and understanding this diversity and the interaction is important to predict coral refuges, but also to assist coral in their evolution, perhaps help, to help them to speed up their evolutionary processes. And this requires optimized and standardized study methods. And I'll quick, this is the last slide. Um, here on the left-hand side is an uh, MDS plot of um, coral uh, viral populations that from, from uh, studies where different methods were used. And um, basically, the, the viral populations clustered based on the method of isolation. Um, on the right-hand side, this is a published study by Sweet et al., where um, he isolated um, bacteria from different parts of the coral, coral and also using different methods. And again, you see a very strong clustering based on the method and the, and the part of the coral used. So it makes it very hard to make comparisons, comparisons between studies, and that's an area we really need to work on. So I'll leave it at this. Thank you very much. <laughs>